Well, let's get into the Word today. We are doing our series called Aliens and Strangers, and uh, today's message is called The Priesthood of Believers. And our text is from 1 Peter 2.9, which says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. A couple verses earlier, in verse 5, Peter calls us a holy priesthood, and here a royal priesthood. We are both holy and royal priests. What does this mean? Well, before we launch into our message today, I want to just give you a brief history of time from the beginning, no, I won't go that far back, but I'll go back to the time of Abraham and give you a history of the priesthood. And uh, at the time of Abraham, there was no organized uh, priesthood or no organized religion, really, in those days. From the time of Noah, some followed the one true God, but most, sadly, had drifted away and they created their own gods. For example, at the Tower of Babel, if you recall, the people were unified in trying to be their own god. They were going to build this tower to heaven, and they could climb the tower, and they would be higher than they thought, than got the one true god, and they would be gods themselves. But, of course, God confused their language so that they would no longer work together for that purpose. It would seem that few continued to worship God, Jehovah. But clearly Abraham did, even though it seems from Scripture as though Abraham's own father did not worship God. In those days, the patriarch of the family uh, was also the priest. Whatever God they worshipped, the father of the clan read the rest of, led the rest of the family into worship. And in the story of Abraham, we come across sort of an unusual story. When Abraham's nephew Lot was still living in Sodom, before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot still lived there, and some neighboring kings came, and they defeated Sodom, and, and they carried Lot and his family into captivity. So Abraham gathered up a bunch of his neighbors, and they went after those kings, and they defeated them, and Abraham rescued Lot, and they, they came home, they returned home with all their plunder from the defeat, and, and they came to the king of Salem, and Salem was the name of Jerusalem at that time. And so they came to this king of Salem or Jerusalem, and his name was Melchizedek. And Genesis 14, 18 through 20 says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now, Melchizedek is somewhat of a mystery. We don't know much about him, but he was clearly both a king and a priest, and Abraham tithed a tenth of the spoils of war to Melchizedek. We later see in the book of Hebrews that Melchizedek was a foreshadowing of Christ, who is also both a priest and king, but obviously at a, an infinitely higher level. Then, once Moses was given the law, the priesthood was established. God declared that Israel would be a nation of priests. The Levite tribe was the tribe established to carry out the work of the priesthood, and the descendants of Aaron would bear the title of priests. When the Israelites entered the Promised Land, there were certain cities that were selected and set aside, and they were scattered throughout the land where the Levites would live so that there would be a city of priests near every resident of Israel, so that wherever you lived in Israel, you were never very far from a Levitical city. So there were, there were priests scattered throughout the land. And only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies in the temple one day each year on the Day of Atonement. So the people, in order to properly worship God, they had to go through the priests 
to offer sacrifices and other uh, worship duties. But when Jesus, our high priest, came, he changed all of that. When he died, if you recall, he offered himself up as a sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And on that, at that moment, on that Good Friday, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that it was no longer necessary for believers to gain access to the presence of God through the priest. They now had direct access through our high priest, Jesus Christ. This was life-changing for the early believers. And we read in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. So the book of Hebrews explains so well how the new covenant has replaced that old covenant. And as I said last week, the book of Hebrews was written primarily to Jewish people to help them understand how Judaism had now been transformed into Christianity. And Paul wrote most of his letters to the Gentile believers. So Hebrews was written to the Hebrews, and we just read how it explains you know, that we can now enter the Holy of Holies through the blood of Jesus. And Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 18 through 21 to the Gentiles, he said, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So what this is saying is that the Gentiles, who were once foreigners and aliens to Judaism, have now also been made fellow citizens with God's chosen people. We have full access to God through Jesus Christ. Israel was a nation of priests, and now we also are part of that nation of priests. And I don't have time to get into this today, but there are some who would teach that the church has replaced Israel as God's chosen people. Israel rejected Jesus as Messiah, so God turned his affections Elsewhere, Some would say that all of the prophecies regarding Israel that have not yet been fulfilled will now be fulfilled in the church. We don't believe that. You, you cannot read the book of Revelation without realizing that God still has a special plan for the nation of Israel. Yes, they rejected Christ as Messiah as a nation, but there are many pe Jewish people who we refer to as Messianic Jews, such as Beth, right here, yeah, there she is, uh, that, that believe. Our faith is individual. We don't, you know, I told you before, just because we're called a Christian nation doesn't mean we're all Christian, okay? Uh, only those that believe and confess Christ as Lord will be saved. But there is coming a day when Israel is going to embrace Jesus as Messiah and the bulk of the Jews living at that time, I hope all of them, will accept him as their Savior. The believing Gentiles in the meantime, we have been, the Bible says, we have been grafted into the vine. We are now part of the family of God. We are now his chosen people. We are now a nation of priests. And as we read in our opening verse, every one of us is part of that holy, royal priesthood. Each of us has the same access, the same authority, and the same responsibilities as priests of a holy God. Now, over time, religion got organized, and the church became established and allowed traditions to become as important as Scripture. How many of you know that if we aren't careful, we tend to drift back into our old ways, back to what we find comfortable, even if it's wrong. Well, the organized, I'll just say, at that time it was called the Catholic Church. 
and the organized Catholic Church leaders, they felt that ordinary folks couldn't be trusted with such a great responsibility. And so, besides, as long as a few maintained power, they, they could guide the direction of the church. So, the church assigned certain individuals, and they called them priests, and they, they basically took the priesthood away from the folks and put it in the hands of a select few who thought they knew better. Well, then along came a man named Martin Luther. There you go. All, all you Lutherans out there are happy now I mentioned that. All right. So Martin Luther came along, and, and he, he was Catholic, okay? But he started reading the scripture, and he realized that all believers are priests. In fact, and that created a ruckus, let me tell you. And uh, we call it the Reformation, which we just celebrated the 500-year anniversary of the Reformation. But Martin Luther, he looked at the writings of Peter, and he wrote, this word priest should become as common as the word Christian, because all Christians are priests. So we should start calling each other priests. I want you to look at your neighbor this morning. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, good morning, priest. Say it. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, all right. So if we start all referring to one another as priests, I guarantee the world will look at us like we're aliens, okay? If someone asks you, are you a Christian, you could respond, yeah, in fact, I'm a priest. You could. You'd be within your rights to do that. Think of the looks you'll get. One thing, too, about being a priest is that you sort of have to pay attention to how you behave, okay? One of the things that takes a little getting used to as a pastor is that over time, people around time, town, they, they begin to recognize me. I have to be careful how I live because people know that I'm a pastor. So sometimes, you know, I'll get into situations where, you know, I, maybe I start to lose my temper. I know you find that hard to believe, but I'll start to lose it in public and my wife will just gently whisper in my ear, remember your <laughs> But it's true, you know, in the church we have pastors and other offices, but I am no more of a priest than you are. I'm not. We have one high priest, and his name is Jesus Christ. Now, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says, it was he, Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Those offices are gifts to the church for the purpose of what? To prepare God's people, the priests, for works of service. We are all in the ministry, okay? Pastors, and other leaders, they are just there to give guidance and direction to the rest of the priests and help equip them for the work that has to be done. Some of us still have a pre-Reformation mentality. We, we think only the pastor can serve communion, only the pastor can water baptize, or only the pastor can perform funerals or many other duties. A lot of church people have the attitude, that's not my job. That's the pastor's job. Well, I find it humorous when, for example, someone is sick and only the pastor can pray for them. It's as if pastors have these powers that other believers don't have. We are healed because of what Jesus has done for us. He is the healer. Anyone can pray. Mark 16, 17, and 18 says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. It doesn't say just pastors. It says all those who believe. You can drive out demons. 
You can do that. You can be pr protected from snakes and other poisonous things. No, it doesn't say that we should go out of our way to tempt God by passing rattlesnakes around the sanctuary. <laughs> and all you folks watching on the internet, okay, we may be aliens, but we're not snake handlers here. At least not while the cameras are rolling. Um, <laughs> but these verses, it says, are for all those who believe. You don't need a preacher to do these things, and you don't need to ask my permission either. I've had people come to me and say, yeah, you know, we've got a family gathering, and Thought it would be nice if we could do communion, but I can, can, do I have your permission? You don't need my permission. Just go ahead. You know, I Arlene Turner, she's in a nursing home. God bless her. I just went and saw her last week and I interrupted her communion time. She was having communion all by herself. God, God bless her. I that was just I was just so neat. I felt that interrupting it, but she, she got back to it after I left. She didn't say, Pastor, well, since you're here, why don't you give me the No. She knew that she didn't need me to do that. She understood that. She is a priest in, in her own right, as we all are. So, as priests, we have some distinct privileges. I, I want to go through a few privileges this morning that each of us should enjoy as priests. First, as we've already mentioned, every priest has direct access to God. We all have the privilege of praying directly to God. We don't have to go through anyone else. Several times in the New Testament, we're told that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. He is our high priest. He is the one through whom we pray. Part of Jesus' final instructions to the disciples are found in John 14, 13, and 14. Jesus said, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Why do we pray in Jesus' name? Because, because of the power and the authority in that name. The prayers we pray are not of our own selfish desires or to bring glory to ourselves. We pray on behalf of a lost and dying world. We pray on behalf of our fellow aliens in this world. We pray for those in authority. We pray God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray these prayers in the name of our high priest who is sitting at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for us, and his name is Jesus. And as priests, every one of us has that privilege and responsibility. The Old Testament priests offered up sacrifices. Well, guess what? We still have the privilege of offering sacrifices up to God. 1 Peter 2.5 says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. No longer are we required to <coughs> offer animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice ended that. We are now to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What's a spiritual sacrifice? Well, let me read to you from Romans 12, 1, and this is from the message. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering, a sacrifice. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. For some of us, we may say, well, I have to do that. Remember, it's a sacrifice. It is, but it is a privilege. And some of us, honestly, some of us would rather offer up a sheep than to <laughs> sacrifice our whole selves in service to God. But that's what we priests are to do, or should do. In the Old Testament temple, different priests, they had different duties. You know, there was the high priest, but then the other priests, they had other duties in the temple, and some of them had the duty of maybe keeping the place clean. Maybe their whole ministry was polishing the brass. You know, this is my ministry. This is what I do. I'm a priest, 
and I polish that brass and I keep it shiny. What's your job? And I don't just mean in the church. The Bible admonishes us to work as unto the Lord. What if we looked at our jobs as the work of a priest? Sure, we have an earthly boss, but what if we went about our daily duties at work as though this was our priestly ministry? We would get up in the morning and spend time with God, and we would thank Him for the privilege of making us a priest in that kitchen we work in, or in that factory, or in that bar, or in that office, or in that store. It would change the way we view our work. It's not just work, though. It's, it's what we do at home. Everything we do at work, everything we do at home, we do as a sacrifice to God. Or in our, in our neighborhoods, we, we are called to be salt and light in this world. We may be aliens in our neighborhoods, but we are alien priests to our neighbors. Who is my neighbor? Jesus, of course, he said to love your neighbor, and someone asked who his neighbor was, so Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. We all know the story. But I don't think that it is an accident that in that story, the two who passed by were a Levite and a priest. Okay? So, the Levite was from the priestly tribe, and a priest was a descendant of Aaron. Neither one of them helped. Ouch. As priests, are we being good neighbors to those in need all around us? We have the privilege of being called priests, and we have the privilege of sacrificing of ourselves to help others. As priests, we also have the privilege of being preachers. That's right. We may not all be called pastors, but we are all called to be preachers. Our opening text again is 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are each called to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. How do we do that? By preaching. That's right. The Great Commission says in Mark 16, 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. That's for all of us, not just a select few. Now, how do we do that? Do, do, we, do we take a pulpit with us everywhere we go and <laughs> plop it down and start preaching to people? You know, we're aliens in this world, but we haven't been called to make a nuisance of ourselves, okay? But here's the thing. Preaching isn't the only way in which we have come to understand uh, preaching today. It isn't just standing at a pulpit and giving a, a lecture or a message. Preaching, in this sense, is showing others the good news. We have good news, don't we? I hope we do. Each of us has a powerful testimony of God's transformative power in our lives. How he brought us out of darkness into his light. And it's not just the words we use. Have you ever heard the expressions, actions speak louder than words? Remember that we're a holy priesthood. That means that we behave in a way that brings glory to God, not reproach. If our behavior doesn't match our words, then our preaching is ineffective. You probably also heard people say, I can't hear you because your actions are drowning out your words. Sometimes words aren't necessary because our deeds speak for themselves. You know, not all of us are verbal. Uh, God uses different people with different gifts in his priesthood. Use the gifts that he's given you. Use the skills that he's given you to reach the people that he's put into your life. So we all have the privilege of being preachers. And as priests, we also have the privilege of being ambassadors to this world. 
I find it interesting that in some countries, in England, for example, in England they call their government offices ministries. They have a prime minister. They have a minister of health and social services and so forth. One of those ministries is the Minister of Foreign Affairs. They handle all of the diplomatic duties. They send ambassadors to foreign nations to represent the government of England. Each of us, we each are ambassadors for Christ in, to this world that we are aliens in. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. You know, in this world, in government, it is considered a privilege to be an ambassador, to speak on behalf of someone else. And that's what we are. A couple of verses before this, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We have all been given a ministry. As priests, we each have the privilege of helping humans be reconciled to God. Reconciliation is an accounting term. Without Christ, people are in severe debt. They are in such debt that they will never, ever get out from under it. The wages of sin is death. But we have the privilege of bringing reconciliation, of closing the account, of showing people that their sins don't have to count against them because their debt has been paid if they'll accept the payment. What a privilege. What if you had the job? Imagine. You had a job, the bank sent you out to knock on people's doors and, and tell them, hey, I just want you to know the bank sent me to tell you that your debt's been paid. You know, you, you'd, you'd feel like Oprah. Look under your seats. It's Jesus. <laughs> your debts have been paid. You're in the ministry. You are a priest. Remind yourself of that every day. And then live accordingly. We are priests to a lost and dying world. And we have the solution to what they need. You have God's blessing and God's authority. Let's reach the world. Let's be priests. Pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, Lord, that we are now a nation of priests. You have made each and every one of us a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood. Lord, I, I believe that we have hamstrung all of the priests that you have called. We have limited them by saying they are not allowed to behave as priests. Lord, we're changing that today. We're sending each and every believer in this place out to be priests at home, priests in their workplace, priests at school, priests in the marketplace, priests wherever they go, priests to a world that is sorely lacking, that is hurting, that it is in need of the ministry of reconciliation. Someone to go and tell them their yeah, debt's been paid. They no longer have to live under that burden of debt, of shame, guilt, and despair, and hopelessness. But we can bring the joy of the Lord, the peace that passes all understanding, the freedom that can be found only in Christ. Help us, God, to be priests in this world. To live like it. And to, Lord, to love as only you can love. To love others 
in that way, to be a neighbor in the way that you have called us to be neighbors. Help us, Lord. Pray for Jesus. I'm going to ask if there's anyone here today, you're, you're not a priest because you haven't dedicated your life to him. You haven't made that ultimate sacrifice and said, Jesus, I give you my all. It's not worth much in its present condition, but I give it to you and I know you can make something wonderful out of my life. You can promote me right to the priesthood. If that's you, step out from where you are and come forward. I'd love to pray with you and show you how you can dedicate or rededicate your life to serving Him with all that you have and with all that you have. If there's anyone, I'm just going to wait a moment. Please come.